Good morning, everyone. Let's begin with a prayer. Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our beloved Guru, Paramhansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, friend and guide Swami Kriyananda. Humbly we bow at thy feet. Fill us with thy light and thy love that we may move through the world as channels of your peace. Help us not only to know, but to live. By the prayer, change no circumstance in my life, change only me. That we may bring that light and healing to all who are willing to receive it. Om. Peace. Amen. I was talking with a friend earlier this week, um, and naturally the subject of what's happening in the world right now, and particularly what's happening in the United States, <clears throat> here in early June of uh, 2020, the subject came up and she was talking to me about all of the civil unrest that we're experiencing, the pain and the suffering and the anger that we're seeing as a result of the experiences and observations of injustice that people are feeling in the world and the reaction to it. And she's someone who is naturally affected by the emotions of her surroundings. She's someone who's easily affected by what's going on in the world. And so she was talking to me about the ways that she's struggling right now, feeling all of that intensity, all of that, um, yeah, yeah, the intensity of what's happening, good, bad, the positives, the negatives, everything. There's so much emotion being poured into the circumstances that we're experiencing. And she was taking a lot of that in and it's just struggling with that a bit. And so she was asking me, what, what do we do? How do we overcome that? How do we find our center in the midst of so much chaos and what is unrest? Um, and she's somebody who also, we were, this was in the morning and I was sitting out on my, my deck um, in the Ananda community in Palo Alto. And she's someone who also lives in the community. And I said, can you look outside right now? And she said, yes. And she was looking outside. And I said, what do you feel? Um, and we talked a little bit about it because what I was feeling sitting out on my porch, I could see all of the trees. I could hear the birds and the animals and all the little critters who have come out and are so, um, who are just taking ownership of the land. Well, we human beings are kind of uh, sheltering in place and, and staying inside a little bit more. You can feel all of the animals and the creatures and the plants and everything really taking ownership of the land. And what I, I said to her is, can you feel the peace? And we talked a little bit about that and, and ways that she could experience that and feel that. And the essence of the story is not about what happened for her, but it's about the power of what I was feeling in that moment in the community. Here's this little tiny bubble of acreage in the midst of Silicon Valley, which is absolutely feeling all of the tumult of what's happening in the world. There are so many people standing up for, as I said, what they believe in, standing up for their experiences and observations of injustice. And in all of that chaos and all of the confusion and the emotion that's happening around us, right here in this little bubble in the midst of Silicon Valley, was stillness. There was peace. You could feel it vibrating through the consciousness of the plants and the animals of the people. Why is that? Why is it that this little bubble of land could emote so much stillness, could emote so much peace? It's because of the consciousness of the people that are living there. It's a group of people who have come together and actively chosen, deliberately chosen to live a life for God, to live a life for principles of higher dharma, to live a life for peace, to invite 
that peace, that love into the world. And the experience we were having, the, when the consciousness of the people surrounding this area, surrounding our little bubble, our little community, invites that light into the world, the environment itself, it, it was reflecting that light. It was reflecting that joy. The peace and the stillness was a product of the consciousness of the people that were drawing it. It was magnetized by those people that have been meditating there, serving with God, praying with God, loving God for decades. And of course, when you think about what we can do in the world at a time when we're watching so much civil unrest, where we're watching so many people in pain, what we can do most in the world, what each one of us can do is we stand up in defense of the light, when we stand up in invitation to the light, inviting in receptivity to the light, is to shift our consciousness. Everything on this planet is a reflection of consciousness. Everything in the material world is comprised of the consciousness of God. And if we want to be channels of that light in the world, if we want to invite peace and love and justice into the world, we have to be reflections of that at the highest consciousness, at the highest level. We come into the world trying to force change, trying to enforce with pressure change on the world. What we end up doing is just coming up against whatever it is that we are opposing. And equal force, equal uh, we're applying that equal force, we just continue to push. And what happens in the midst of that struggle? Fatigue, anger, agitation, we have to drive ourselves deeper. This isn't the energy that we want to share with the world. You know, I was thinking about, as I was thinking about this concept of changing our consciousness and the light that can come in, I was reminded of a story that someone told me many years ago. Um, I'm not sure if they experienced it firsthand, but at any rate, the story is the same. They were talking about a train that had broken down um, right across the road in India. This was on a road in India. And um, traffic in India has its own current and its own energy. People just sort of weaving it, it through traffic however they need to to get to their destinations. Or so I'm told. I haven't experienced it for myself yet. Um, but the, what... Uh, this person was telling me when she was talking about this story is that the train was blocking both sides of the road and people were getting agitated on each side of this train uh, that was broken down and so no one could cross. And slowly, as over the three or four hour period that it was taking to get the train moved away, people in their cars had just start, tr were trying to get around and were kind of building up, you know, just, just wiggling their way into the front, trying to get as close to the front as possible and s expanding outward, just anxiously trying to force their way across this train that was blocking the way. So that when the train was finally moved, what they were met with was two rows of cars, two walls of cars, just one against the other, and they couldn't cross. They still had to fight and wiggle their way through because it was this application of pressure. I want something to be different. I will use my will and I will drive myself through that. And what were they met with on the other side? A wall of opposition. There's another option for each one of us. And this is what, you know, over the past week, so many people have been sharing stories from Martin Luther King, from Mahatma Gandhi, are uh, activists um, who are channeling the light, who are speaking from that place of ahimsa, of nonviolence, of truth, of power, of light. What is the difference there? It isn't passivity that they were practicing. They had great willpower, great energy. The difference was their consciousness. The difference was what they were able to bring from inside, how they were fighting how they were standing up to injustice. And it's all about our consciousness. You know, I was thinking about um, Mother Teresa who said, do small things with great love. And she's such a beautiful example of that in the world and how doing small deeds one after another invoked great change. And she was able to, uh, on a large social and political scale, all of these people that I just mentioned, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, on a grand scale, on political and social platforms, they were able to invoke great change in the world. But they were doing it from a place of love. They were doing it from a place of serving the divine, serving divine grace, of serving truth, of serving the light, serving the love of God. And when we do small things with great love, what we find at the end of that is 
that we can also do great things, powerful things, big things with great love. That doing big works in the world doesn't necessarily mean that we have to use our force, but that we can come from that place of our consciousness and of love. Everything is about consciousness. Everything comes back to the way that we approach any situation or circumstance in our lives. When I was in college, um, I was on the water polo team, and we would often play teams that were much better than us in terms of statistics. That was the way that my coach felt we were going to get better, was to stand up against really big opponents, people who were obviously going to be stronger, faster, quicker, smarter in the water than we were. And before every game, and studies have gone on to show there are many professional athletes who use this technique now, and it's been shown, it's been proven to work. What our coach would have us do is every night before we went to bed, uh, the night before a big game when we went to bed, he asked us to, to spend five to ten minutes just quietly closing our eyes and envisioning ourselves in that game tomorrow, envisioning ourselves getting up really big out of the water, throwing the ball, putting it in the back of the net, making great moves, being strong, being quick, being fast, all of the things we needed to do to stand up to this Goliath opponent. Um, and and we would do that, each one of us, and you would we would come in the next day, and inevitably we didn't win. I mean, we were playing teams that were much stronger than us, much bigger than us, but you could find those little moments of strength with in each one of us, those moments where we were able to do something that we didn't think we could do, or we were able to be stronger or beat an opponent who statistically should be much better or much stronger than we were. Why is that? It's because we came in with the, the willingness and the consciousness to know that what we were doing could work. It always comes back to our consciousness and the way that we can interact in the world, the way that we can move through the world and be a force of light. On Saturday of last week, we had a question and answer series here. And in that question and answer series, um, this question came up. Shanti Rubinstone was giving the, was answering questions and she was hosting the series. And this question came up. And at the end of her answer, her response, which was so lovely and beautiful, and I don't have time to recant all of it now, but at the end of her response, she said that there are things that happen in this world that we can't deal with on a human level, that are difficult for us to deal with on the human level, that the only way we can meet them is to meet them on a spiritual level. That the human mind can't wrap, our, our, can't wrap its emotions around it, but that we can greet it and meet it on a spiritual level and find the strength and the energy that we need in order to face the opponent in order to face whatever it is that is standing in opposition, that is standing in our way, whether it's an example and an experience of deep injustice, whether it's an obstacle that we're facing on our path towards self-realization, whatever it may be in our life, whatever that obstacle is, if we meet it on its highest level, if we come with the intention of bringing those spiritual qualities those higher principles of truth, of love, of light into the experience. We use that as, a, our, our, as we use that as our tools to move forward. Then what we're finding, what we find is that we've left space for divine grace to flow through us, that we've left space for God to act through us in those moments. And when God is acting, miracles occur. When God is acting, we are able to accomplish things we never imagined possible because we're bringing light. The answer, the solution to everything is to invite God's love and God's light into the circumstance. What we can do in this time, I come all the way back to where I began with my friend who was absorbing all of the energy, all of the emotion of what's going on and saying, what can I do? The answer is practice gratitude, practice Love, practice light. I almost said practice gratitude. I might start coining that as a new term. Practice gratitude. Practice love. Practice light. Bring all of our joy, all of our energy into those circumstances and situations without discrimination. Ask God to be present in everyone, in everything, in every moment of 
creation and every circumstance in our lives. You know, today is June 5th, and it was just almost to the day 31 years ago that uh, the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre happened. And last night, when I was just reading through the news and reading po protests, the video of that the man, he's been coined the, the tank man, um, but this Chinese man who was standing up against the tank, these th four tanks that were coming toward, uh, toward the protest. And you can just see, he's just standing in front of it and the tank starts to swerve this way and he moves and stands in front of it there and it swerves back this way and he moves. And eventually, you know, again, it's not that he's successful in stopping those tanks from where they were going, but I was struck by the power of an individual. We have so much power within us. If we choose to act from that place of right action, if we choose to bring that consciousness of serving the divine, of bringing light, of deliberately being a channel of God's light and love into every circumstance without discrimination, this is what's needed to shift the world. The world cannot change by simply applying pressure to it. Consciousness is what creates and manifests everything in our reality, from the material objects and items to the values and the ideologies and the thoughts that we see dancing and weaving their way through our culture and our society. If we can change ourselves one at a time, open up in receptivity to that consciousness of the divine and share that consciousness with everyone that we meet, we're impacting great change. Swami Kriyananda has a song, um, and in it he says, you can't beat out the darkness with a stick, and you can't beat out the darkness with hate. It is not with power and force and hate and aggression that we will impart change on the world. If we change our consciousness and we stand up, inviting the light, offering it in, we will find that slowly others are magnetized into that flow of love, are magnetized into that flow of peace. If we want peace in the world, we must be peace. If we want to share love in the world, we must be love. It is up to every single one of us individually to rise up in receptivity to the divine. And it may seem that this change is slow coming if we just start with ourselves, if we just work on our own consciousness. But I'm reminded of uh, the story when the Buddha was self-realized. It was said that when he reached that place of self-realization, that consciousness, the entire consciousness of the planet was uplifted along with him. Each time we bring light into a circumstance, into a moment, into our own lives and consciousness, we are affecting everyone and everything around us. The more that we can meditate, the more that we can pray, and we find in the center of each of those moments, God is waiting for us. Let us practice light. Let us be models and examples of that joy and that peace in every moment and in every circumstance of our lives. God bless you.